Live from WILL-TV at the University of Illinois, a debate between candidates for the 13th Congressional District. Brought to you by Illinois Public Media, WCIA3, WCIX49, the News Gazette, the League of Women Voters, and the NAACP of Champaign County. Welcome to the 13th Congressional District Candidates Debate. I'm your moderator, Jennifer Roscoe. We wanted to make this debate different from others you've seen. We are going in-depth on a few topics to really get to the heart of what these candidates believe. There are no podiums, no lights for time cues, just the two people who want to represent you in Congress. Let me introduce them now, Republican Rodney Davis, and Democrat Ann Callis. Thank you both so much Thank for you. being here. Asking the questions for tonight's debate, Tom Kasich from the News Gazette and Hannah Meisel from WILL. My role is asking for clarification when needed, making sure things keep moving for all of you and for our studio audience. During the, the debate, we're also going to take questions for the candidates from our viewers and listeners on Twitter and Facebook. If you're on Twitter, just use the hashtag IL13-2014. All right, let's get right to it. It's been about a year since the launch of insurance exchanges under the Affordable Care Act. We're going to start on that issue, health care. We drew straws earlier, and Congressman Davis gets the first question from Tom. Congressman Davis, you've pivoted from wanting to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. What has changed over the last two years? Well, nothing's really changed. I don't believe I've pivoted at all. I've been per perfectly clear since I was a candidate for this office and since I've been serving. I. I would be for repealing, I would be for replacing, and frankly, I've helped lead the charge to try and make some fixes to the Affordable Care Act, and I'm going to continue to do that. My latest fix uh, was the Hire More Heroes Act. It came about as an idea from my Veterans Assistance, uh, my Veterans Advisory Board, and Brad Leviti from Madison County, Illinois, came up with the idea to ensure that those veterans who are actually receiving their health care through TRICARE or Department of Defense wouldn't count towards the Affordable Care Act's 50 employee limit. And in theory, that would incentivize small businesses to hire more of our veterans, hire more of our heroes. That bill went from an idea to legislation. It passed the House of Representatives with only one no vote on the House floor. You can't get much more bipartisan than that. And it's sitting, waiting in the Senate to be heard. It actually passed the House again as part of another package, a larger package, and it sits in the Senate along with over 380 good pieces of legislation, many common sense fixes to the Affordable Care Act. But Congressman, getting to the Health Care Act, Tom, asked specifically what would you change or repeal? Well, that's one specific change that I led the charge on, Jennifer. So I'm proud to be talking about that change. I want to make sure that we put together a plan that's not going to cost consumers more. And when you look at the Affordable Care Act, there were many in Illinois, over 200,000, that signed up for private policies. But 185,000 individuals were estimated to have lost their coverage before the Affordable Care Act, the coverage that they were promised that they could keep. Those are the types of changes as to why we need a system that's going to cover pre-existing conditions, that's going to make sure that we have no lifetime caps. We're going to make sure that youngsters who can't find a job in this economy, are able to stay on their parents' insurance plan until they're 26. These are provisions that are good common sense provisions, but we can't continue to see families have to pay more. And in the first year, besides the fact that $2 billion was spent on a website, many families, especially women over the age of 55, are paying an average of $2,100 to $2,800 more per year for their health care coverage. The increased costs on families have to stop, and that's why I want to do whatever I can to make the fixes that are necessary, and many of those sit stalled in the United States Senate, and they need to move to the President's desk. Judge Callis, uh, same question to you. Are there parts of the law you'd like to see changed, anything that Congressman Davis has, has suggested? Well, I think Mr. Davis has developed political amnesia because he voted 50 times to repeal the ACA and also shut down our government to the tune of about $24 billion because he didn't like the law. He and his party didn't like the law. But traveling around our district, uh, p people do like parts of it and people do, I've heard as it unfolds, having become a candidate when it first came out and then now traveling around, 
uh, that people like that they can stay on their parents' insurance policy till they're 26, since we have nine colleges and universities in this district. Uh, seniors like that they, the prescription drug cart costs and Medicare Part D savings uh, close to $2,000 a year, and no, pre, no discrimination against pre-existing conditions. So they do like that. And I hear more and more stories. For instance, a woman came to my office about a month ago, and uh, five or six years ago, her son had developed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He was aged out of her insurance, and she tried to shop around to get him treatment. It was enormously expensive. And she told me that her son finally passed away, and she said she firmly believes that if the ACA were in place at that time, her son would be alive. So I hear stories like that. So we have to keep in place what works. 14,000 people in our district, in the 13th Congressional District, have insurance now that they didn't before the ACA was passed. So to take a Congressman Davis and his party's position to rip that away from 14,000 people isn't what we should do. We should see what works, see what, see, and what I would do is travel around the district and listen, have office hours, open it up, listen to what people are saying so anecdotal evidence would turn into empirical evidence and then we can fix what doesn't work. Right now, are there any things that you don't think Work. Well, I've heard that people do like, if they want to stay on their own insurance policy, they should be able to stay on their own insurance policy. I hear that a lot. I hear about some, uh, also some small businesses, they'd like to increase the size instead of 50 to receive uh, the subsidies. So I do hear that. So those are two specific things that I would try to start working on. And of course, lowering the cost for middle class and our working families. So that's, that's how it unfold. that's how I would listen and see how it unfolds and then get to right to work. And we want to get to cost. You, bro you brought it up. Yes. Hannah, you had a question. Um, Judge Callis, mm -hmm. if one of the goals of the Affordable Care Act is to make more, uh, make health care more affordable to cover more people, of course we have people who are signing up for Medicaid and for yes. subsidies, but for those who don't qualify for the subsidies but mm -hmm. still see their premiums rising, what can Congress do to fix the law to make it more affordable for these people? Well, I've, one woman came up to me, for instance, and she's never had insurance. She's self-employed, and she's terrified that that's going to be ripped away from her if, if, if the Republicans have their way and, and repeal the ACA. So again, it's listening listening to the people and how we contain costs, because that was the goal of the ACA, is lowering the cost. So what can we do to lower the cost? And, and just listen and get to work. But you don't have any specifics in mind right now? Well, yes, I think that we should, as I had mentioned before, that, um, that we should be able to, with companies that are 50 plus companies, should be able to possibly receive some of those subsidies and people should be able to stay on their own insurance and I think that would be able to lower costs. And Congressman, same question. If the goal of the ACA is to uh, lower costs for people, do you see that happening? Well, if we're successful in changing and replacing the Affordable Care Act with a much more market-based approach that's going to continue to cover pre-existing conditions. It's going to continue to make sure there are no lifetime caps. It's going to continue to make some common sense changes like the ones that I've offered, like the Hire More Heroes Act. You know, I, I, I appreciate my opponent uh, reminding the viewers that I voted 50 times to either repeal, or replace, or change the Affordable Care Act. It's actually 54. I guess I would ask my opponent, which of those 54 votes would she not have taken? Uh, what would she not support? What would she support? These are common sense changes that we've already tried to implement, and that's exactly why I'm going to continue to fight to lower premiums. And I will tell you, I'm on Obamacare. By law, members of Congress have to sign up for their health care benefits on the ACA exchange. My premiums went up. My deductibles went up. And in my family's case, I've actually reached the out-of-pocket maximum that a family would have to pay due to a catastrophic illness because my wife, Shannon, who's here with me tonight, actually is a 15-year colon cancer survivor. We've seen how families have to struggle to actually meet that out-of-pocket maximum. Those are real costs to real families, and we need to make real changes to this law. All right, we're going to have to leave health care at that. Before we get to our next topic, we have a question from Twitter from Addison. About half of this district will vote for the other candidate. How will you represent the other half if you win? Congressman Davis. The exact same way that I've been representing the entire district for the last almost two years. 
I believe I've gone to Washington making the promise that I wanted to pass a farm bill. Not only did I help pass a farm bill, I helped write it from its infancy into its final completion as a member of the conference committee, a committee where members of both parties come together with members of both parties from the, from the Senate. And we sit down, we work out our differences, and we put together a good common sense piece of legislation. And that's exactly what that farm bill did. We set good farm policy to make sure that agriculture remains a pillar of a growing economy. And we also saved taxpayers $23 billion. And it's those common sense fixes that I'm going to continue to do on a district-wide basis, regardless of whether or not one votes for me. Judge Callis, how would you represent the people who didn't vote for you? Well, I'm uh, glad Congressman Davis did pass and, and you know helped pass the farm bill. But this is the most non-productive Congress since we've measured Congress. So uh, it's, it's a do-nothing Congress, and we need to start getting things done. When I was chief judge, I in a bipartisan way instituted significant court reforms, started the first veterans court in the state of Illinois in Madison County, and, and I'm glad to see that Congressman Davis has shown an interest in our Madison County veterans. But we started that very rudimentarily, no taxpayer of dollars. When I put a committee together to institute an innovation or a reform, I never cared if that person were a Republican. I never cared if that person were a Democrat. What we put the best people on that committee to get the job done. So, for instance, we were able to create the vet first Veterans Court in the state of Illinois, very rudimentarily, no taxpayer dollars, recruiting the best people to be a part of that program. It has grown to be a model for our nation. Hundreds and hundreds of veterans have gone through that program and graduated successfully. They don't reoffend. As a matter of fact, it was nominated for a national award by Congressman John Shimkus, and it won that award. Also, I had two, a, a few months ago I was in an event, and I had two Vietnam era veterans come up to me separately, and they told me the Madison County Veterans Court saved their lives, that it was the first time they felt like someone cared about what they were going through. So I think I have a record of reaching across the aisle and getting things done, and that's exactly what I would do. I always had an open door policy as chief judge, listening and then acting. All right, next topic. This is a big one, jobs and economy. Hannah has the first question for Judge Kellis. There is a push to increase the federal minimum wage to $10.10 an hour. But the Congressional Budget Office says, says that a hike could lift 900,000 people out of poverty, but it also suggests that half a million could lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. And of course, some small business owners say that they can't afford it and they would have to either lay off people or push the price on to consumers by raising prices. Mm -hmm. So, Judge Kellis, do you support an increase in the federal minimum wage to 1010? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have traveled around this district, gone to many, many community centers. People are choosing between food and diapers. People are going to school full time and trying to better themselves and they keep falling further and further behind beneath the poverty line. So it's time that we raise the minimum wage in this nation. Six out of the 10 minimum wage earners in the state of Illinois are women. Many of them heads of households. So absolutely. And then when we raise the minimum wage, these people then are uh, moving into commerce and spending money and, and in reinvigorating our communities. So it's time we raise the minimum wage. Is there anything that you would want to implement to offset the cost to businesses who might struggle to uh, raise that wage for their workers? I just think it's time we raise the minimum wage. Now, again, I, as, as chief judge, I listened, had an open door policy. So if I would, of course, listen and see what was going on and see if actually uh, businesses were, costs were raised. But fundamentally, fundamentally, it's time we raise the minimum wage. It's time, I hear it from so many people in the community centers traveling around our, our district and it's just time. And Congressman, same question to you. Do you support raising the federal minimum wage to 1010? I've been clear. I would support an increase in the minimum wage as long as it was paired with some offsets, some tax credits, similar to a bill I introduced with my friend Dan Lipinski, a Chicago Democrat, to allow for tax credits for businesses to hire young apprentices in the trades and labor uh, section of our economy. And we need to grow infrastructure jobs. I, I've said all along, we need to offset these costs because as the Congressional Budget Office estimates, and that's not necessarily the most partisan organization, it estimates that if the minimum wage was increased to 1010 without any offsets, 
500,000 families would lose that minimum wage job. I don't want any family to lose their job. We need to continue to work together to find the solutions to grow our economy. Illinois is lagging behind the rest of the nation. As a matter of fact, Illinois over the first, over the, the first seven months of, of this year has been last in job creation because we have a dysfunctional government in Springfield. We need to make sure that we work toward creating real jobs. And I'm happy to be joined by my dad here tonight. My dad walked into a restaurant, a brand new restaurant in 1959 called McDonald's. And he started working what was then a minimum wage job. Started flipping hamburgers and shucking french fries and had no intention of ever staying there. My dad worked his way up and because he did that, he allowed my family to achieve the American dream and no young person should ever listen to a policymaker who says that you should turn your minimum wage job into your career now because your career should be the American dream, not keeping the job that is paying you minimum wage right now. And I go to colleges, talk to many students, and I ask them to raise their hands if they're on minimum wage, and many do. I say, how many of you want to stay in that job and make it a career? Not one single hand is raised. And speaking of colleges, it's going to cost our universities and colleges in this state millions to implement any minimum wage increase in a time where the state is not fully funding higher education. It's a time where students will have to be laid off from a job when they are working so hard to help pay for their ever-increasing cost of college education. Judge Callis, the Congressional Budget Office, the same CBO we were talking about earlier, reported that the lowest earners in the middle class have lost ground over the past three decades, while the income of the highest earners has grown sometimes by three digits. Mm -hmm. Is it the government's role to address income inequality and if so, how would you do that? Well, I think we, one way to address income inequality is raising the minimum wage. And um, I, don't, I don't know who Mr. Davis is talking to with these students that, that, that say that that's their career to have a minimum wage job just because the minimum wage is raised. It will raise them up to be able to afford to uh, attend the college and be able not to fall further and further behind in the poverty line. So I don't understand that. And, and it's, I heard him you know, point his finger at dysfunctional government in Springfield, but how about the dysfunctional government in Washington, D.C. today? So I think that that's one way that we can um, hand, address income inequality. Also, it's time that we pass the Paycheck Fairness Act. I talked to many, many women uh, around this district and the fact that in Illinois it's 70 plus cents on the dollar that, that women make not commensurate with men. So it's time we do that. Also I think that we could uh, even as Warren Buffett had said it's unfair that we pay that he pays a lesser tax rate than his secretary pays. So there can be some reform in the tax code especially closing some of these loopholes for corporations. For instance uh, the corporate debt uh, corporate jet tax uh, loophole where it's $4 billion, that $4 billion that could come back into our nation's economy if we close that loophole. Congressman Davis, how about you? Well, I, I will tell you, when we look at uh, the minimum wage and the students that I talk to, um, make, let me make myself perfectly clear. Many of them work at the universities to pay their way through college. And when the university tells us that they're going to have to lay off students. That is not a net positive if they can't have an offset to that minimum wage increase. We want the students to be able to continue to work through their education. We need to also look at equal pay. And I will tell you the best thing you can do to find out on a, poli on a, on a government official or a politician as to how they view equal pay is to look at what they can control. And if you look at my office, I pay the women in my office an average of $4,000 more per year while my opponent when she was in charge of the Madison County court system, had actually, there was unequal pay of anywhere from eight to 15% per year from the male to the female employees. How about the question about income inequality though? Should the tax code be changed? Yes. Oh, absolutely. We've got to grow our economy to grow jobs. The income inequality under this administration in Washington has grown to levels we haven't seen in decades. We need to do everything we can to create good paying careers. And that's exactly what I've tried to do throughout my, my short time in Washington. That's why I helped write and work through the entire process and 
and make sure that it was passed into law as a member of the conference committee for WARDA, the water infrastructure bill. Water infrastructure is, is enormously important to our entire district's economy. Most of the, most of the uh, products that go up and down the Mississippi River are coal and grain. That screams the 13th district of Illinois. We need to upgrade our locks and dams. We need to put our trades and labor folks back to work. And that's the first step in doing so. So much of this is you've been talking about university students. We actually got tweets from two of them. At Vishal Diswar says, I'm a student at UIUC and an undocumented immigrant. Immigrant, How do you plan on supporting students like me? And then another said, what are your thoughts on comprehensive immigration reform that might help me? I'm an international student at UIUC. My future after graduation is uncertain even if I get a job. Judge Callis, how would you help these students? Well, first I want to address what, what went on in my office with the Chief Judge's Office at Income Inequality. Um, Madison County was unionized by AFSCME, and I'm honored to have their support. And we would do co contractual negotiations set by AFSCME, so I don't know where he's coming from with that at all. Um, also, it is time. It is time we pass comprehensive immigration reform. I have traveled around this district. Students have uh, addressed that, but also looking at going through and, and uh, touring Research Park and talking to the executives at Yahoo there. Their number one, their number one issue was comprehensive immigration reform. So it's time that uh, Mr. Davis asks Speaker Boehner, who came down to raise money for him, hey, let's take up this bill and pass comprehensive immigration reform. And it's not, it's, it's a difficult process. It, it, it also, it 10 to 13 years, and, and people have to pay fines, and they have extensive background checks. And it's, it's a deliberative, difficult process, and it strengthens our borders, and it's time. Also, if we pass comprehensive immigration reform, the GDP would be increased in the next nine years, 3.3%, adding, I think it's uh, $1.4 billion into our nation's, or $1.4 trillion into our nation's economy within the next nine years. GDP after that would go up 5%. So it's really time. And I think it'd be about $1.4 trillion added into our economy, so it's time. Congressman. Well, I've said I'm open to discussing a comprehensive immigration reform package, but the one that passed the Senate that my opponent supports is not going to pass in the House. We have thrown out some good ideas to move in a step-by-step -step approach to address many of the issues that the students at the universities and colleges that I'm blessed enough to represent may be affected by. I find it, I find it just a completely wrong for universities to attract students into majors where we need engineers, we need mathematicians, we need scientists, we need people who are going to work with technology, especially in cybersecurity. And I find it wrong that we don't have a system in place that will then allow them to be employed here in America. We come, tell them to come get educated here and then tell them to go back and compete against us. These are some of the types of provisions that we can come together on, but the far right and the far left don't want to solve this problem. We have a broken visa system. Most of the illegal immigration in this country does not come from the southern border. It comes from people who fly into our airports and then overstay their visas. We have to develop a system that's going to be a true solution without playing politics. And I want to make sure that when my children ask me 27 years from now, which was the last time this issue was supposedly fixed, I want to make sure that we put a solution on the table that's actually going to work to fix that broken visa system. Which leads us into foreign policy. Last month, President Obama and a handful of U.S. allies launched airstrikes against the group that calls itself Islamic State or ISIS. Obama recently described it as, quote, a long-term campaign. Tom gets to ask the first question in this next category, and that question goes to Congressman Davis. So far, you've supported the president's limited airstrikes, uh, the military action against the Islamic State. What would success look like to you, and how long are you willing to continue with just primarily airstrikes in that region? Well, Tom, uh, it's a great question, but I don't profess to be a military strategist, and I don't have access to the intelligence that the president does, and that's why I've supported him when he has asked. He has said he's listened to the generals that are under his command as commander-in-chief, and he has told us that this is a plan and a strategy that will succeed. If he and the generals and our military leaders offer up a different strategy, 
um, I'm willing to take a good look at that and consider it. I want to make sure that victory is wiping out ISIS. This is the most humane, radical terrorist organization that we have seen in, our, our, in my lifetime. A, an organization that glorifies beheading individuals. An organization that intelligence estimates uh, put at about 31,000 soldiers. These are people who are waging a war against humanity, not a war against Christianity, not a war against the West, because we have to remember the majority of those who have died at the hands of ISIS have been fellow Muslims who weren't pure enough. These are the types of, this is the type of battle that we have to eradicate this group. And I do believe the president missed a golden opportunity to do so when ISIS was marching across the open desert of Iraq. I wish he would have acted sooner. I was proud to support his plan before we left Washington just a few weeks ago, and I stand ready to go back tomorrow if there's a better plan how, to eradicate it. How would it. you know you eradicated it? I mean, is, is there any way of telling? Couldn't this go on forever? Well, when ISIS doesn't control any towns or cities in Iraq or Syria, I believe that that's as close as we can get to eradication, but that doesn't mean we stop. That doesn't mean we stop working with our allies in the region. That doesn't mean we stop asking our allies to take the lead on the ground. That doesn't mean we stop trying to make sure that ISIS does not have the ability to re regroup and make more attacks on innocent, innocent Americans and innocent, uh, innocent Syrians and Iraqis. Judge Callis, a recent CBS News poll shows that a majority of Americans think that U.S. ground troops will eventually be necessary to remove the threat of ISIS, and only 20 percent think that airstrikes alone will do the job. Do you agree? Well, I do have to uh, separate my professional from my personal in this, and that my son is an Army Ranger, an infantry officer. He was deployed to Kuwait. His deployment was extended because of the deteriorating uh, security situation in Iraq. So he is blessedly home now, and I was able to welcome him home. But uh, yeah, the airstrikes I did support. I am not privy to the security briefings. One, my son did not tell me much, but one thing he did tell me is the sheer and utter brutality that's going on there. So I think we need to uh, join with the non-jihadist Sunnis in Iraq, a multilateral approach, not a unilateral approach, and have to listen to our military leaders. I, I know and believe that we have the best military in the world, but we should not go in there unilaterally and get bogged down. But it would have to be a wait and see. I know it's a rapidly, rapidly uh, developing situation and listen to our military leaders. And I think, Mr. Davis, you meant um, inhumane, not humane, when you said humane. But uh, Hannah asked, yeah. would you support boots on the ground? If our military leaders say so, and if it's a multilateral approach, I would. I, I have seen firsthand. I know we have the best fighting force in the nation. My, my son's now in a, a different unit, and I know if uh, he is called over there, he and his brothers and sisters in arms will do the best of their ability to defend our nation. Judge, do you think more terror attacks against the U.S. are inevitable? And if so, should we be prepared to give up even more civil liberties than we have already? Well, it's a balance. It's a balance. And I hope it's not inevitable. I hope not. So I think that uh, having been a judge, I think any of these types of processes that, that, that would uh, continue to gather information whatever the means that it should go through judicial process. But uh, security has to be balanced with our freedoms and our individual freedoms. Are you concerned with the way it's sort of played out over the last 10 years? Well, having, having been a judge, uh, yes. I, I think a little concern. I just think it should, go the, the, it should go through a warrant system and it go through a judicial process and be, be, have judicial oversight, absolutely. All right. Up next, entitlements. Federal programs like Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid food stamps, among others. Judge Callis will get the first question from here. Um, social, social Security is one of the largest domestic expenses of the federal government. And uh, with this you know, so-called baby boomer generation retiring, the CBO expects those costs to keep rising without the revenue to fully support it. So Judge Callis, you say you want to preserve the system. How would you do that? And would you be open to changing benefits or increasing 
the taxes to bolster the system? Well, I, Social Security is so important. Traveling around this district, it's so important to a lot of, of people in this district. As a matter of fact, I was at a pig roast in Calhoun County, and an older woman came up to me, and she grabbed my arm, and she said, please do everything you can to protect Social Security. So I would be against any chain CPI, raising the retirement age, but I think in a bipartisan manner, we could create a commission and, and see how we could keep Social Security solvent for not only for the now, but for future and future generations. I, I saw my, my grandma, who was an Irish immigrant and came over and she was a nurse at St. Elizabeth's Hospital. And I saw her when she retired rely on her social security firsthand. So what should we keep on the table and possibly raising the payroll tax cap? And, and where that is, I don't know. I'd have to listen, but it's, it's, it would be a, a great priority for me to keep Social Security solvent and how we do that, how we can work together and get it done. If the payroll tax cap, um, if that option wasn't politically viable at the time, do you have any other ideas of how to raise that revenue to keep it solvent? Well, I don't know why that wouldn't be politically viable at that time. I think that should, that should be on the table. But uh, absolutely, I would be against any type of change CPI raising the retirement age. And Congressman, same question of what would you do to keep the system solvent? Well, I want to say, first of all, thank you for correcting my, uh, my error in uh, grammar, uh, inhumane and humane. <laughs> I apologize to the viewers, uh, but I do appreciate it. And I do agree with my opponent that we do need to create a bipartisan commission to deal with Social Security because as we've seen actuaries say, Social Security is not going to be sustainable as is. And I hope we can have an adult conversation, a bipartisan conversation in Washington to do so. And that's exactly what was, what was part of the Ryan budget proposal to do, which was to create a bipartisan opportunity to discuss possible solutions to Social Security and its, and its insolvency that's coming up in about 2032, 2033. These are issues because we both agree. We don't wanna see benefits cut at all for anyone who's on Social Security. And I'm gonna to continue to fight to make sure that our Social Security recipients get everything that they were promised. We need to make sure that we have Social Security, not just for this generation, but for future generations. And Tom, I noticed I didn't get back, I didn't get asked your question. I think my voting record clearly shows that I want that balanced approach between privacy and between protecting Americans. I wanna make sure that our intelligence officials don't acquire so much data and they tell us that they need to find the needle in the haystack, that they make the haystack so large that they'll never find the needle. My voting record clearly shows that I've been supportive of those issues to rein in in, in, in issues that are relating to our individual liberties and our priorities. And back to Social Security real quick, would you be open to raising payroll taxes to keep the system solvent? I'm open to making sure that we have that bipartisan commission that's going to discuss a portfolio of solutions. I've talked about discussing means testing. I don't think it's, I don't think it's appropriate that Bill Gates can receive Social Security benefits when others who are living on Social Security have to do so. I think Bill Gates would gladly give up his Social Security benefits to save the system for those who need it the most. That needs to be part of the discussion. We need to make sure we have that adult conversation and I hope there are some new ideas that come out. Uh, the president stood in a room speaking to the Republican conference in Washington and professed his support for change CPI. Uh, many in the room were surprised by that. So I think the president's going to want to discuss change CPI and I don't know if that's a proposal that would become reality or not. So you both have brought up bipartisanship, but what would be, when you're in that room, this is for both of you, what would be your non-negotiable? That with this, what is your top priority? That those who are, who are 55, 56 and above that are receiving benefits right now see no benefit cuts whatsoever. And what's your non-negotiable? Is for Social Security? Correct. All right, chain CPI, absolutely against that and raising the age, eligibility age, retirement. You mentioned the Paul Ryan budget, um, mm -hmm. it, it, which you voted for, which would balance federal budget in 10 years, but you said it was an imperfect plan. Mm -hmm. Are there parts, are there a lot of parts you'd like to revise or undo or there's, eliminate? Yeah, Tom, there's, there's no perfect bill that comes out of Washington. Uh, and what we need to do is make sure that we judge the quality pieces of that legislation versus those that you may not be as 
is, uh, is favorable on. And, and in this case, you know, there, we have to, as Americans, we have to look at balancing our budget. This is the only budget that was ever offered that balances in 10 years. I think that's a very great goal. But, I mean, you, you, you said it was imperfect, so you must have is. a few oh, the way ideas that's, that are, you know, about it that need to be eliminated. I do. I, I do. And when it comes to addressing Pell Grants, when it comes to addressing other programs that are related to, uh, to saving, I believe we ought to be able to get back to our constitutional appropriations process because a budget is never going to be implemented fully into law we need to go through and reprioritize how we spend money. And that's exactly why you need a vision. And that's exactly what this Ryan budget did. It gave America a vision <laughs> that will have a balanced budget in 10 years. And it also, it also gave us the opportunity to make the Senate actually have to fulfill their constitutional duty and pass their own budget. Because I proudly supported one of the first votes I made in Washington was for no budget, no pay. I think the Democrats in the Senate ought to lay out their vision for America, and they did because they weren't going to get paid if they didn't. But you know what? Typically, their budget never balances and increases spending at a time when we have been working in a bipartisan fashion to reduce our deficit to the lowest level since World War II. It is a travesty that we cannot continue to work together to cut spending in areas that need to be cut and increase it in areas that need to be increased and do it through our constitutional appropriations process, which is the way Washington used to spend money when Washington worked. Hannah, you had another question? Yes, we were going to move on to uh, more about entitlements, uh, namely food stamps welfare. So according to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, the average food stamp recipient received $133 a month last year, which is about $1.48 a meal. Uh, food stamps are just one example, like I mentioned, of the safety net for people who are struggling to make ends meet. And right now, the federal government's uh, poverty line for a family of four is around $24,000 a year, which is based on measures from the 1950s. So, Congressman Davis, to you first, who is most at risk of falling through the cracks, and how would you change these programs and their qualifications to serve those people? Well, thank you very much for your question, Hannah, and I actually made sure I was part of that debate in the Farm Bill. Uh, we actually put together some very common sense provisions that ensure that we save taxpayers $8 billion. There's a, a loophole that some states were using called the heat and eat loophole that gave food stamp benefits to anyone who qualified for $1 of heating assistance. And we didn't take away that program. We actually just raised the barometer to $20 and it saved taxpayers $8 billion in the program. That's $8 billion that we can put towards making sure that those who need benefits the most are going to get them. I also believe that we ought to implement some type of work requirement that was, that was commonplace under the Clinton era welfare to work program that's been changed during this administration. And I, for the life of me, cannot understand why America should be satisfied with a program that doesn't require an able-bodied adult who has no dependent children, who is not enrolled in a, in a training or education program, who doesn't take care of an adult dependent, who doesn't meet a plethora of other exemptions. I don't know why we can't pair them with a job, and if a job is not available, why can't we pair them with community service or volunteer service opportunities where they can learn skills that will get them the best benefit that their family can have as a job? Judge Kallis, we want you to chime in on this. Uh, yeah, I, you know, talking to people in these community centers, um, I, I think it is um, not the right approach to s demand someone that they have to have a job when you don't know what that person is going through in their own lives with whatever uh, domestic abuse, drug and alcohol abuse. So I think it is a uh, presumptuous uh, way to govern. And if you'd listen to, uh, to Mr. Davis, they were burning the midnight night oil. They were passing bill after bill after bill. I mean, this is the most non-productive Congress that we've had since the history of Congress. So I think it's a, a holistic approach. And we need to, first of all, we shouldn't have let, as, as uh, Congressman Davis, Davis's Congress did, when the long-term unemployment benefits were extended by the Senate, they died in the House because everybody went on vacation there. 185,000 veterans, 185,000 veterans were left out in the cold because they didn't have the long-term unemployment benefits. So what can we do? Well, I think uh, strengthen 
uh, Pell Grants, for instance. So these people can uh, go to school, people that are on uh, minimum wage can go to school and also uh, be able to better themselves, get a better job. And it, it wouldn't be the Ryan budget way where the needs analysis testing was constricted and the eligibility was reduced. Also, um, what I was able to do as chief judge, and I think this is, this is a philosophy that I would have as a congressperson, and that is you're on the ground and you're listening. What can you do at these community centers? When I've gone there, people have, there, there are things that are going on with the Urban League, like man camp, when people come out of prison or probation, to, to learn, teach them and how can they go, get into the employment universe. So I really, having been a statewide leader, on justice and mental health and restorative justice issues, not only veterans court, but a true believer in drug court and mental health court, where people can become productive citizens by going through these programs. I could see where I could travel around our district to uh, each county and, and see what they have going and see what they don't, and really being a bridge to the justice system, which I think would fill a true gap to help the people in this district. We've got another question from Twitter. This is from at Perry Ag Ed. What will you do to help improve new fuel energies in Illinois and the U.S., Judge Kelly? Well, um, I was pleased to see that Illinois is number one in renewable energy sources. And we have great opportunities here with our nine colleges and universities, especially here at University of Illinois with the wonderful innovators here. So what can we do to expand on this and grow great jobs right here? Draw out our innovators, join them with our local businesses. So our students graduate from this wonderful university and want to raise their children in these wonderful world-class communities. So how we can advance them forward. And I, I saw that that uh, Decatur had a chance to get the genotype lab, and that was lost to Fargo, North Dakota. So how can we do that to, to sustain ourselves, but also draw in businesses? What can we do? So I, I would just continue to work, build coalitions, get things done. Congressman Davis, new okay. fuel. Uh, well, I appreciate Ann's comments, and that's exactly what I've been trying to do, is build coalitions to ensure that we actually make our next mission to the moon to make America energy independent. When you look at energy independence, we have the ability to grow our economy by doing something as simple as, as building the Keystone Pipeline. The president and his administration has overstudied this permit more so than any other project in our nation's history. And even members of organized labor estimate it would create 40,000 new jobs. That oil is coming from Canada via train and via truck now. Let's put it in a safe pipeline. Let's make sure that we can create American jobs. And that's exactly the first step in becoming energy independent. And that's how we actually use all of our energy sources, especially those that are homegrown right here in Illinois. Uh, we, have, we have a perfect example of a state that decided to make themselves energy independent, and that's North Dakota. In North Dakota's minimum wage, it's not set by government right now. It's the marketplace is about $18 an hour because they made the decision to make North Dakota energy independent, and they're reaping the benefits of a very low unemployment rate. They're reaping the benefits of an economy that's growing exponentially. And we're sitting here in Illinois with the worst job growth in the first seven months of this year. It's unacceptable, and things need to change. And I hope to continue to lead that charge from Washington, D.C. All right, next topic, moving to education. The 13th Congressional District includes the University of Illinois' main campus, U of I Springfield, Millican, Parkland College, Lincoln Land, and a number of other colleges and universities. Recent estimates show tuition continues to get more expensive, while total student loan debt has grown to more than a billion dollars for the very first time. Education is next. Hannah will get things started with a question to Congressman Davis. Congressman, two years ago in a debate in this studio, you said that you would increase access to Pell Grants and added that you would have not supported the Ryan budget that would have slashed funding to Pell Grants. And then in the end, you did support a Ryan budget that freezes Pell funding over the next decade, thus cutting about $90 billion over the next 10 years. What changed? Nothing changed, and frankly, that was a Ryan budget that was done before I was elected. Just because Paul Ryan's the chairman of the budget committee, each budget that gets put out is takes his name. That was a much different budget than the one that I supported that balances in 10 years. But let's also look at the Ryan Murray bipartisan comprehensive appropriations package that I supported that increased Pell Grants. It's not just about putting a vision in place. And when you talk about cuts, only in Washington, D.C., 
can zero growth in a vision document be considered a cut? We are looking to make sure that we balance the budget. And if we get back to our constitutional appropriations process, instead of running off of a continuing resolution where it allows the president and the leaders of both parties of both houses to determine how Washington's spending money, if we can get away from that process, you're not gonna have things like across the board cuts and sequestration. You're gonna be able to allow a rank and file member of Congress who's a freshman to have a say in spending decisions and how we reprioritize to make sure that college is affordable. I'm proud that I actually voted to stop the student loan interest rates from doubling in June and July of 2013. This is something that should never have happened because at that time, or that's something that should never have happened because at that time, Congress was in the business of setting student loan rates. Congress shouldn't be in the business of setting student loan rates. Families should be able to take advantage of student loan rates that are at historical lows. And we need to make sure that we change the debate from how much a student is going to pay for an ever-increasing debt at the end of their college education and what interest rate it's going to be because we stop them from doubling. And we need to do what I've been doing as a member of Congress. When I go to college campuses, the nine universities that I'm blessed to serve, including my alma mater, Millican University, thank you for mentioning them, and the eight community college districts that make up this district, I talk to those who are in charge about, they, when they ask me to raise the Pell Grant again, I say, what are you doing to make sure that that Pell Grant goes further for our students? What are you doing to make sure that students have the ability to work on the university if they want to, to help pay their college debt so they don't have that debt when they leave college. That's the type of leadership that I've been exhibiting in this, on this issue and in this district, and that's exactly what I intend to continue to do in my next term. And Judge Callis, would you support um, an increase to Pell Grant funding, and how would you pay for it? Well, uh, absolutely, we need to support an increase in Pell Grant funding. And how we pay for that is, I think, uh, talk, what I talked about before. And also, there is a uh, bill out there called the Government Waste Reduction Act. And it will go after and see where we can cut, see what we could slash, see where we could save some dollars into our uh, national economy. And, and I just have to mention, uh, Mr. Davis, you sat in this, this studio and you said you wouldn't vote for a Ryan budget to cut Pell Grants, and then you voted for a Ryan budget to cut Pell Grants. So you say one thing and do another, and then say another thing, and then, and then do another thing. Another uh, program that we have that can bring in billions of dollars is the HEAT program. It goes after Medicare fraud, waste, and abuse, and Medicaid fraud, waste, and abuse. I think it's in seven United States cities now, and it's a U.S. attorney-driven program that's been very, very successful. I think strengthening those types of programs but talking to students um, they do rely on Pell Grants I talked to uh, uh, one woman whose uh, husband and partner was deployed and she was trying to struggle and still go to school and Pell Grants were very very important to her and that was on the campus of Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville so also I think people it's the next bubble that a trillion dollars student debt so how do we address that? And I think people who have graduated and have these uh, the student debt which should be able to renegotiate their student loans at the current rate. Also, you shouldn't do what the Ryan budget does, and that would be charging students interest on their loans while they're still in school. All right, we gotta move on to the next topic. We gotta get everything in. Earlier this year, Congress put off funding a comprehensive transportation bill until next year, though revenue for the program has dropped off rapidly in recent years. In a decade, transportation spending fell by 12%. Transportation, the next category. Hannah has the first question here for Judge Callis. Judge Callis, would you support an increase in the gas tax, 18.4% uh, 18, 18 per gallon, uh, excuse me, federal gasoline tax for bridge and highway repairs and other transportation items, given you know, what Jennifer has laid out? No, I would not. I, I think that just to overly burden some on our middle class and working families. But uh, the transportation bill, it was, it's, it kicked the can down the road, which causes a lot of uncertainty for our labor, whether they're gonna have any infrastructure projects or not, and I've heard this from a lot of our labor unions. So uh, again, I would be against a gas tax. And Congressman, uh, you sit on the Transportation Committee. What do you think? Well, before I get to that, let me address uh, what my opponent has said. The, let me be clear. The Ryan budget I voted for did not cut Pell Grants. The only issue on Pell Grants that I've addressed is actually voting to raise Pell Grants. 
it is an issue that I'm going to continue to address and I'm going to continue to make sure that we put college affordability first because I've got a daughter who's going to be going to college next year. I know that many families are facing costs that they, did, they didn't imagine would be that high when they took their child to kindergarten for the first day and dreamt that they would be able to get that college education. We need to work to reduce the cost of attending colleges, make sure the state lives up to its promise. Transportation. I, I, during my endorsement from the Chicago Tribune, I was called an infrastructure wonk. Uh, and this is an issue that I've been talking about throughout my entire campaign in 2012 and now. I was one of the few Republicans who actually stood and said, we need to invest more in infrastructure. And how do we do that? Do we do it by simply raising the gas tax, which even most uh, policy organizations on the right and the left agree is going to go down and dwindle and put ourselves in the exact same position we are today with an ever decreasing amount of money that we can dedicate toward infrastructure spending? So that's not the best idea. What we need to do and what I've been talking about is putting together a portfolio of funding sources. Let's look at energy independence. Let's build the Keystone Pipeline. Let's take revenues from making America energy independent and put it towards, put it towards building our crum rebuilding and building our crumbling roads and infrastructure. And that's exactly what we did on the water infrastructure bill that I was proud to, to co-sponsor and, and pass. And that's exactly the type of bipartisan leadership that I'm going to continue to exhibit when it comes to our highways and our bridges. And I want to make sure we have that debate. And, and as a matter of fact, I actually uh, I, I drove an electric vehicle here in, Cham in the Champaign area because it was a trade with my colleague Janice Hahn, who talks about having an electric vehicle and never filling her car up with gas and never putting one penny towards the highway trust fund. It was a great example, a bipartisan example, where we talked about the different transportation needs in her region, which is downtown Los Angeles, in my region, which is 14 counties, and the electric car. I'd like to thank Charlie Chaplin for renting it to me for a day. I couldn't get home to Taylorville. So these are issues that we need to address on our committee and put that portfolio together, and I can't wait to get back to do that. Uh, locally, <clears throat> there's a lot of talk about high-speed rail in Central Illinois, and especially through Champaign-Urbana. How could such an expensive project be financed with today's federal transportation revenue? Well, it's being financed, and it's becoming a reality on the Chicago to St. Louis corridor. I've been somebody who's worked on that project from its infancy in a bipartisan manner in, spring, in the Springfield area, and we're seeing the improvements. And what we need to do is make sure that we put good policies in place, and we make sure we get that portfolio of sources that are going to go beyond just the gas well, I guess tax. what I'm talking about is the one in, through Champaign-Urbana that would operate, I think, at 220. That's a, that's a that, plan? I mean, is that really possible? The, the cost of that? I don't like to say anything's impossible when it comes to infrastructure, Tom. We just have to make sure that we put our good policies in place and mechanisms to make sure that America is able to afford that infrastructure so that, so that Champaign can be the beneficiary of a high-speed rail corridor that's going through Champaign. I'm proud to work with Laura Weiss and, and Mayor Gerard and all of the officials who have come to me and talked to me about this project, and we're going to continue to make sure that we put infrastructure first, and that's exactly why I requested that seat on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and that's exactly why I want to go back to, to remain on that committee. Judge Kellis, do you think that's a doable project? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't absolutely say no. What I, my role as your Congresswoman, if I'm honored to be elected, is what kind of infrastructure projects are feasible and reasonable and what can we do to improve our communities here. And um, Mr. Davis said he was in leadership, in, uh, leadership on transportation in D.C., then why wasn't a comprehensive transportation bill passed? Why was the can kicked down the road? And I'm sure it's fun driving around in an electric car, but I don't know that how that helps the people of this district. We need to get back to serving the people that we were honored to be elected by instead of serving ourselves. So it's an entire philosophy change that needs to be done here. We're just getting down to the last couple of minutes. Tom, you had a question you wanted to ask about military gear to local police departments. Yeah, Judge Callis, one of the big issues around here that yeah. has risen out of the events in Ferguson, Missouri, Absolutely. was the militarization of local police. Mm -hmm. uh, we've reported that a federal program sold dozens of assault rifles and night vision gear, a helicopter, an MRAP to area police departments. I know it's happening in Springfield and here. 
Uh, is that something the federal government should do? Well, it probably sounded like a good idea in the beginning because it, it was excess military gear. But uh, seeing the visual on TV, what happened in Ferguson with these tanks and these police officers dressed in absolute military gear and on with assault weapons with demonstrators on the other side shouldn't happen. So there should be some transparency and oversight. And, and I can tell you, my son is an expert on M4 assault weapons. That takes a lot of training. So it, it concerns me that, that uh, police officers wouldn't have the training even to handle these, these types of weapons. So yeah, I think that, that this should be uh, looked at and, and see what you can do with this type of program. Congressman? Well, I think some of our police officers, unlike my opponent, are actually the most well-trained uh, individuals we have. But I too am concerned about MRAPs. I too am concerned about the visual that we saw in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, and that's why this program needs to get, take a, be, be looked at by members of Congress. We need to ensure that it's going to provide the equipment that's going to be beneficial to our communities. Would you just prefer that it be shut down? The, no, and that's exactly what I'm getting at. The program itself, we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater because the same program has given DeWitt County a Humvee. And you know what the DeWitt County Sheriff's Office does with that Humvee, Sheriff? Uh, sends deputies out when it's, it's snowing and it's icy and he pulls stranded motorists out of the ditch. These are good things that are being done by excess military equipment, and we have to be very diligent in making sure that we don't get rid of those opportunities. We have to make sure that we address the visuals that we saw in Ferguson with the MRAP, but we also have to make sure that those driving through DeWitt County get an opportunity to, to get served by Sheriff Schaffner too. Uh, quickly, you had a question about climate change. Yes, very quickly. Do you believe, the first question goes to you, Congressman, do you believe that climate change is real and that it's man-made? And what could the federal government do to reduce the effects of climate change? Well, I've been clear. I've said uh, climate change is real. Uh, we can discuss how much of it is natural and how much of it is man-made. And what we have to do is continue to do what America has done, lead the world in emissions reductions, but, but at the same time, not sacrificing growth and jobs in our economy. Judge Cameron. Climate change absolutely exists. I mean, man-made climate change exists. And all we have to do <laughs> is look out our window in some days and, and absolutely have firsthand knowledge that it exists. So yes, I think that emissions restrictions should be in place, but not at the expense of jobs. So I think there can, it's not a black or white issue, but it's a fine balance. But we continue, and I think we have such a great opportunity here, again, with our nine colleges and universities to really go to alternative, to, to explore the alternative uh, energy and renewable energy sources and really be a leader in our nation, in our nation in this district with renewable energy sources. Okay, really quick, because we only have one more minute, but I have to ask, this was on Facebook, if you had a song that played <laughs> while you walked in, what would it be? <laughs> what would your theme song be? We got a wrap on a I have one. note. All right, All yes. right, Katy Perry's Roar. <laughs> okay. Do you have one, Congressman Davis? What's your theme song? Um, let's say uh, Creed, higher. Okay. <laughs> we like that. All right. Well, that, <laughs> now we're all going to like contemplate that. that. that there good. you go. We're out of time for tonight's debate. Thank you to the candidates for Congress in Illinois' 13th District, Ann Callis and Rodney Davis. Our thanks also thanks. to the candidates' campaign organizations, our panel of reporters, and our audience, both here in the studio and following on TV, radio, and online. I'm Jennifer Roscoe. Good night. Tonight's debate was brought to you by Illinois Public Media, WCIA 3, WCIX 49, the News Gazette, the League of Women Voters, and the NAACP of Champaign County.